what's interesting is the the better your security gets, you have this opportunity to move from security to privacy. I'll talk about the difference in those two today. Um, and you know, and, and this is a bit of a persuasion talk. I want you also to think about possibly moving in that direction as well. My talk is in three parts. Part one, we're going to talk about some security work we did. And uh, I want you to think durable. Think durable defenses during that part of the talk. Part two, I'm going to talk about the reckoning when we tried to, tried to commercialize that tech. And then part three, I'm going to talk about our attempt to go cryptographic strong defenses and then you know, for the win. We'll see, we'll see how these hardware defenses compete really effectively against cryptographic, um, crypto cryptography-based defenses. So part one, think durable. I want to talk a little bit about a project I had a few years ago with DARPA called Morpheus. And one of the things that uh, the DARPA project was striving to do was mm -hmm. uh, it, it had the goal of excuse me oh, it had the goal of uh, supporting a broad range stopping a broad range of attacks and at the time you know I thought like what do we do well in terms of computer security and uh, we're pretty good at finding and fixing vulnerabilities and we got good tools to do that Valgrind, Synopsis Coverity tools are very powerful. Can we find them all? <laughs> Definitely not. But we're pretty good at finding and fixing them when they when they when they rear their ugly head. And then another thing in terms of the hardware community, I think we're really good at stopping a well-known attack. Examples: Arms Trust Zone stopping, you know, memory mischief, Arms Control Flow, excuse me, Intel's Control Flow Enforcement stopping Control Flow attacks. Um. But this is just a specific attack. And you know, how do you anticipate attacks you've never seen before? And that's, I think, where Security World does, uh, you know, very poorly. Get an A on those other two, you get probably a C minus on emergent attacks. When a new attack occurs, and when I worked on this slide originally, there were four attacks the week that I worked on this slide that no one had ever seen before, and there were no protections. It's called these zero day attacks. We're not good at stopping emergent attacks at all. And so as we went into this DARPA project, we thought, can you know a hardware security defense be built to be more durable, something that could adapt to an emergent attack? And our, our thoughts were, yes, it could be. And that's where the Morpheus project came. And so I want to tell you a little bit about Morpheus and it's really different approach to security and then how it really vaulted me into the world of privacy technologies. So Morpheus has a really unique approach to security. Uh, this equation, which is not mathematical, is qualitative in nature, but it kind of sums up what it takes to, to, to penetrate the security of a system. You need vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities are the doors. And once you get inside the door, you're going to manipulate some implementation asset to defeat the existing security of the system. You're going to inject some code. You're going to manipulate some pointers. You're going to build a new stack, et cetera. And then the, together, the doors in, the vulnerabilities, and the manipulation of the imp implementation assets leads to a successful exploit of the system. The whole world is focused on vulnerabilities and they're endless, coming all the time, difficult to find. The machinery to automatically find them doesn't scale. And so you get in this endless security arms race. So we thought, let's focus on the implementation assets. And what we did is we encrypted things in the program that we didn't want anybody to manipulate. We encrypted the code. We encrypted code pointers, return pointers, function pointers, data pointers. And by encrypting addresses in the program, you're essentially encrypting the address space, both the relative and absolute addresses in the system. And unlike previous work, we encrypt them under a semi-strong cipher. And we coupled it with attack detectors. And attack detectors were trying to find somebody utilizing a vulnerability, like a buffer overflow or somebody doing code pointer arithmetic, that's a sure sign of nefarious activity, pointer forgery. And if we saw some of those activities, what we did is we re-encrypted these assets. So if you're trying to discover these encrypted values or fabricate these encrypted values, we just re-encrypt. That was a process called churn. And it had hundreds of bits of true random entropy behind it. 
And like any DARPA project, you know, you're going to develop your design, you're going to build a physical implementation of that design. And, and we built a physical implementation based on the Risk Five Rocket Core. We incorporated the Morpheus defenses into it. And then at the end of the program, the DARPA program, uh, DARPA had this phase called FET, uh, finding exploits to thwart tampering, where they basically put our designs up into the Amazon F1 cloud, which is uh, FPGA-based deployment of the designs. And they used a company called Synac, which is a commercial red teaming enterprise to recruit attackers. And our target, which was running the medical, uh, the mock medical database, the M3DB, Michigan mock medical database, uh, which had a web front end. And you, you, you basically could pull differentially private data out of it. You're supposed to penetrate it and pull out the underlying uh, patient data. That was our attack. Uh, threat model. 535 attackers tried for three months to penetrate our system. And they worked for big bounties. They never told us the amount of the bounties. All I could really see was how many, how often people were trying to attack our system. But, you know, rumored to many, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for bounties, including later in the program, we were still not attacked. They, they instituted a high value bounty for uh, remote code execution uh, on our system. In the end, Morpheus was never penetrated. It's the only target that was never penetrated, even though M3DB had known vulnerabilities. One of the requirements of the FED program is you gotta, had to have software bugs that people knew about, but nobody could forge pointers fast enough to get into our, our target. And the takeaway from this was, you know, always encrypted pointers are really durable defense. We encrypted pointers everywhere, caches, register file, pipeline, only decrypted them when they went to the memory system or the iCache. That's a really durable defense against any kind of pointer manipulation. And since so many attacks need pointer manipulation, you get this emergent attack defense. If there's a new attack and it needs to manipulate pointers, which is very likely, you get this built-in defense. Really turned out to be a really powerful protection mechanism. And so we said, we got to commercialize this thing. So in 2018, I went with Missaker here and Alex and Dave, and we started this company called Agita Labs. And, and Agita was really designed to commercialize the Morpheus technology. Now comes the reckoning. And what the reckoning is, is that selling security, hardware security is really, really hard. In fact, I would argue, you know, for me, it's impossible. Maybe somebody else could do it, but I don't see a way at this point in time to sell hardware security. And, and, I, and I want to tell you why that is. And it's, it's, it's not really a technical reason. It's more of a business reason. But um, in 2018, we spun off out of University of Michigan to make this company uh, commercialize Morpheus technology. And Morpheus does this great job of, of deploying always encrypted pointers into an existing CPU pipeline. Uh, I was on an NSF SBIR, and that's a U.S. funding agency uh, that provides money for er early technology companies to basically do development and customer discovery. And so for a year, my development team developed basically a rock, risk by rocket core with this technology. And I went off and I did two things. I, I pitched investors to try and get what's called seed money. That's the initial funding that you build your company on. And, uh, and, and I... I was looking for initial customers to work with on this. And I could not find seed money or customers uh, to work with this. Probably partly my fault, but there was a lot of huge challenges here and I wanna articulate what they were. First of all, it's really, really hard to quantify your security benefits. Specifically, how is my hard to hack better than your hard to hack or whatever existing technology is already in the market? How, how different, how do you quantify that? That's difficult. That's even hard to quantify after you win a red teaming contest because people will wonder, maybe you got lucky. Maybe the right, you know, they didn't have very good attackers, et cetera. Very hard to quantify. And the second reason, we were way too costly for other things in the market to stop hacking. In particular, we required hardware changes, which in essence are very, very costly you know, at very hard NREs. And our overheads were about 15%, which is probably too high. And we required changes to the compiler tool chain, which nobody liked as well. And the, the reason why we're so cost sensitive 
is because out in the marketplace, in the security marketplace, security is really viewed as a value expected property of a system rather than a value added property of the system. Nobody buys a system and pays extra because it's secure. You buy a system, you expect it to be secure. And because of that, if you have to add something to the design, a recurring cost, a piece of hardware, that is purely tax on the system. And so it's extremely cost sensitive in the security market. And that, is, that really works against hardware security. At that point in 2019, we really reached this point where we either had to pivot or die. My co-founder, Valeria Bertaco, you know, I, that's what she basically told us. And we pivoted. Now, this was late summer 2019. We're sitting around thinking like, how can hardware encryption defenses create a value added feature? Somebody, something that somebody wants to pay for that'll get them a contract, get them a new customer, get them to do something that uh, they couldn't do before. That's value added. Value added is I add this feature and now it does more than it did before. And that does more feature allows you to make money or improve your customer relationship. And, and we had to do this with hardware encryption defenses because that's what we've been investing in for so long. And so at the time, I was really inspired by privacy enhancing technologies. We'll call them pets, that's what they're called. In particular, one called homomorphic encryption, which I think is one of the most amazing technologies to come out of the computing world in the last you know, 20 years. So let's take a quick look at what are privacy enhancing technologies and how are they different than security technologies? First, I want to do something that's kind of dangerous, but I want to define the difference between security and privacy. And I will caveat this by saying this is my definition, because if you want to start an argument, go talk to somebody about the difference between security and privacy. Uh, this is my definition, and it's a very workable definition for me and the things I do. It helps really define the world very clearly, but with the caveat that everybody has a different definition. So security, the goal of security and security research is to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of systems. They call that the CIA, if you've seen that terminology before, the CIA of systems. Privacy, on the other hand, is to build systems that give data owners control over who can see and use their data. So passing control, not from the owner of a server, for example, but to the owner of a data. Uh, of the data that's residing on that server. And these are somewhat overlapping, but they're not the same, right? So for example, if I wanna have perfect privacy, I need to have probably perfect security or very, very good security. But if I have perfect security, it says nothing about privacy, right? I can have perfect security on my server and use your data in ways that would make you cry. So they're partially overlapping and they, they have implications on each other, but they are definitely distinct beasts. Let's take a look at some privacy enhancing technologies and see if maybe there's a space where a computer architect can come and play in the sandbox. So one of the, you know, the most, you know, oldest and most useful of these te technologies is differential privacy, which is a methodology for releasing statistics in a way that preserves privacy. Basically, the way it works is I release a bunch of statistics to the world. And if you take any single element out of my data set that generated this, I get the same statistics. So you don't know anything about a single element or, or person or whatever you're measuring in the data set. Federated learning, another very popular technology. This is a way where you and I can build an ML training model combining your data and my data, but we never share our data sets with each other. So the privacy aspect here is you don't get to see my data set, but together, we get to see the model from the two different data sets. Synthetic data, this is a privacy-oriented technology which allows me to share data with you, but I've anonymized and synthesized the data such that the data, the, the new synthesized data stands in for the real data, but I don't give you the real data. This one's a bit fraught with problems, but uh, uh, it, it allows me to not let show you my actual data. Homomorphic encryption, is a technology that allows you to encrypt, uh, excuse me, to compute on uh, encrypted sensitive data directly without decrypting that data or holding a key to that data. That allows you to do private computation as a service without having to risk the underlying data. 
Zero knowledge proofs, you might have heard of these. These are proofs that that computation that perhaps was done with homomorphic encryption, that the integrity of that computation remains intact at the end of that computation and that, that it used the inputs that we expected. And functional encryption, which doesn't really exist, but they talk about it a lot, is something that limits what is the computation that can be performed on data. So you can run this computation on this encrypted data, but you can't run this other computation. And by that, you can't see the results of anything except what I allow you to see. Now, as a computer architect, I look at these last three technologies and I say, oh my, this is computation. Well, that's what I do. Well, it's on encrypted data. Maybe, you know, I've been building a company that does computation on encrypted data. Maybe I can do this kind of computation on encrypted data. And as a computer architect, I'm really interested in the integrity of computation. You know, technologies like Intel SGX have deployed things like modern memory trees to protect the integrity of computation. Maybe I can build an integrity mechanism that can show you that you ran this specific code. And functional encryption, that's just permissions on integrity checking. So, as an architect, I look at these three technologies and I go, oh, you know, maybe uh, I could come play in this sandbox. But before I describe that sandbox, let's take a look at homomorphic encryption. This, what got me on this whole path was homomorphic encryption. It's an incredible technology. I recommend anyone in the security community go read up on it. It, it breaks the rules of security. And if you've seen some of my past talks, I always talk about breaking rules when you want to do good research. The rule it breaks is the first rule of security that anything can be hacked, right? Saying something that cannot be hacked is pure heresy in the security community because we know anything can be hacked. But you can't really hack homomorphic encryption programs from a confidentiality standpoint. And the reason why is because HE computes directly on encrypted data. In a traditional system, if you want to compute on some data, I send you my encrypted data, you decrypt it with my key, and you compute on it. And then you take the result and you encrypt it and send it back to me. Well, you hold my key, you hold my decrypted data. If you get hacked, then you lose all my data. With homomorphic encryption, I send you my encrypted data. I don't send you a key. And then you, and you use what are called homomorphisms, which is a recipe on how to do an operation directly on the encrypted data. That's powerful. Now, if you get hacked, you can't see my data. Programs in this world are untrusted, right? The untrusted party writes a program, you know, to analyze my genome, for example. They cannot see my inputs. They cannot see my outputs. It's a privacy technology. And these strengths are cryptographic-based strengths. You need to guess a key to see the underlying data. In addition, the programs that are written here are what are called data-oblivious programs. The programs that are written to compute on data that do not know the data they're computing on. As a result, they have no control or memory side channels. They cannot because they can't make decisions on private data directly and they cannot access memory with private data directly. So you get these really nice features. They solve some problems that many of us worry about night and day. And these defenses are cryptographic strength. If you hack into a HE program, you get to steal the ciphertext, good luck. Now, they don't have any integrity defenses, but they, they do have very strong cryptographic confidentiality defenses. And that's what makes them a privacy technology. With cryptographic strength defenses against disclosure, I can now build a system where, for example, you encrypt your genome, you give it to me encrypted, I run my HE program that does disease profiling on your genome, I don't see your genome. I don't see the results of my computation. I send you back your computation and all of a sudden you can see what your disease profile is. And that's what we call zero trust data sharing. I can now send you my genome and I don't have to worry about you stealing my genome unless you guess my key or the crypto is broken in some way. And that's really powerful privacy technology. But there's huge challenges that remain for homomorphic encryption. The performance is really bad you know, expect to slow down hundreds of thousands of times. Incredibly hard to program. Some of us remember the days when CUDA got into our lives and we go, oh man, this is so hard to program. CUDA is a walk in the park compared to programming in HE. HE has got these two just brutally hard aspects to it. One, when you compute on data, it decays. And so you have to limit the depth of your computation trees. Otherwise you lose the data. To get around that, you have to do something called bootstrapping, which makes your program 
a million times slower. And there's no integrity checking. Without integrity checking, I can manipulate your disease profile any way I want. Oh, yeah, you've got all the diseases. I'm a hacker. I just did that. And you don't know whether or not you have all the diseases. All right. But what an awesome technology that you can allow software to compute on data and not see that data. And that those defenses are cryptographic strength. They ignore hacking. Hacking means nothing to them, to their, their disclosures. That's really exciting. And so at this point, the startup, we're thinking about let's move from security to privacy. When you're in a startup, you're going to look at the markets that you're going into. And let's see how these technologies kind of change the definition and the requirements in those markets. At the time, we were in the cloud security market. That's a big market, $30 billion TAM, which stands for Total Addressable Market. Huge. That's how much money they sell into that market every year. Big. 18% compound annual growth rate. So every year, you take that previous year about multiply one point, times 1.18, that's how much your new market is. So it's growing pretty good clip. When you go into a market, you need a value proposition. Our value proposition, our, our system's harder to hack than the others than the other systems are to hack. But without the ability to quantify it, it's really difficult to make that proposition stick. The competitive landscape is really interesting in the cloud security market. There's a lot of existing technologies that are free and cheap, probably don't work as well as us, but they're there and you can use them. And a whole lot of people, all they do is just buy insurance. They don't care, you know, if I get breached. So then, you know, you got to be cheaper than the insurance. And the competitive challenges to be better than everybody else the challenges are, how do I differentiate my security from everybody else, right? Because at the time, Morpheus was hard to hack, but how much harder to hack was it, you know, harder? And then, you know, very high cost sensitivity because of this value expected nature of security, where hardware additions are very expensive and impactful. Slowdown's got to be less than probably 10% for anybody to even consider you. And don't tell me about compiler changes. My programmers will kill me, so... But then you go over to the privacy technology market, which homomorphic encryption and other technologies live in. It's a much tinier, so more than or being too small or 2.6 billion total addressable market, growing super fast. And the reason why it's growing super fast is because of GDPR and California Consumer Privacy Act and the Chinese Privacy Act, all kinds of interesting legislation making it harder and harder to, to share data. And then the value proposition for a technology in that space is let's restore data privacy while enabling safe data monetization and discovery. And data monetization and discovery are things that pay money to companies that can do them when they couldn't do it before. And so the, the landscape, the technology you have to compete with there are things like end-to-end -end encryption, which is kind of a, doesn't do much, can't compute. Homomorphic encryption, which is a very interesting technology a lot of companies are experimenting with. And then also multi-party computation is another very popular technology. And then the competitive challenges are to, to shine in that market, you need to be crypto strength. You can't really come into the pet market and not be crypto strength. And we'll talk about that. And that really changed how we build hardware security. And I want to talk about what it means to build cryptographic strength hardware securities today. Uh, programming can be brutally hard, no problem. If you're better than brutally hard, that's a great thing. And the performance overheads, you know, you want to be less than 20,000 X, you know, which in the computer architecture world, that's like, that doesn't even compute, right? It doesn't even fit into our brains. And if you're less than 300 X, you're a superstar. Yeah, this is my new, that's my new play, sandbox. That's where I want to take my toys, hardware security into the sandbox. So the key challenge is you need cryptographic strength defenses. Now, what does that mean, right? These are today's security defenses. They're non-cryptographic strength. They extend trust everywhere, right? The trust is, hmm, you're not going to side channel my microarchitecture. You're not going to uh, pay money to my IT staff to look inside this box, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's lots of ways. You're not going to find a bug in the software in my enclave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cryptographic defenses don't extend any trust where they don't have to. And in essence, breaking a cryptographic strength defense requires guessing a large key. So if the if to break your system, you have to guess a large key, then it's a cryptographic strength defense. If you have to guess a large key or hack this piece of software, it's not a crypto strength defense. So we want to get to a place to enter the pet market where to break the system, 
only have to guess a large key. So let's go to part three of the talk. Cryptographic, go cryptographic for the win. So let's talk about how do you take existing hardware security technologies and make them a cryptographic strength? So that they're not hackable by software. They're not hackable through the hardware. They're only hackable through, you know, either guessing a key or physically penetrating the trust zone, all right? So first, and this is the most important concept of the entire talk, this bullet right here, is you have to eliminate all software vulnerabilities. There could be no software vulnerabilities in the trust zone. So wherever the zone of trust is, where you do secure computation, there can be no software vulnerabilities, but all software is hackable. All software is hackable. There's no evidence that any software is not hackable. That's true even with formal verification, right? Formally verify your code. I'll hit you with the next Spectre variant. Uh, all software is hackable. So the only solution to this problem, which is a beautiful thing for hardware security people, is there is no software in the trust zone. There can be no software. This is an important distinction, right? We used to think in our minds that the vulnerability in the system is bugs in software. Change this. The vulnerability is software. The existence of software in your trust zone means you cannot be cryptographic strength defense. So you need to build a root of trust for secure computation that does not have software. Okay, I'll leave that there. Second, you need to architect your trust zone so it has no side channels. Now, it's harder to get rid of the analog side channels. For us, we're in the cloud, so it's harder to get access to those analog side channels. So today what we do is we just get rid of all the digital side channels. No control side channels, no memory side channels, no timing side channels, and no microarchitecture side channels. These are digital side channels, and you can actually get rid of them provably out of your hardware design. We can talk about that more later afterwards. Uh, and then we're going to address the analog side channels later. We'll physically protect the, uh, the enclave for now. And then outside of the trust zone, anything you care about, you have to encrypt it at all times with a high entropy cipher. What that does is it eliminates trust in all the software of the system because all the software can see is ciphertext. And there's no keys out there either. And hardware hacking, like, you know, Rowhammer and Spectres and all the stuff we talk about that we love to do, that is only going to get you access to ciphertext, unless you can, you know, do those attacks into the trust zone. So I know I just want to briefly introduce our technology, which is called sequester encryption. And what this is, it's a hardware enclave where there is no software in the enclave and no digital side channels. And everything that's outside of the enclave that we care about is encrypted under a high entropy cipher at all times. So it looks like pure random data. Using this, you can do secure computation and you can blow the roof off the whole market. Before I talk about the technology in detail, I wanna just show you what our vision for a next gen pet looks like. We can immediately advance the technology with hardware security. Where you've got you know, MPC and homomorphic encryption saying you can commute on my data, but you can't see the results. We're gonna go way past that on day one. Here's what we're gonna do. This data owner is gonna share data with this next gen pet user. All right, and she's gonna encrypt her data and she's gonna to attach to it a digital contract. And the digital contract's gonna say, who can perform analyses on this data? What analytics are allowed on this data, right? So she's gonna limit what code he can run and what period of time can you run that code? If someone else tries to run on this encrypted data, encrypted computation, you get a, a fault. If he tries to run outside of this time period, he gets a fault. If he tries to run an analytic that she did not approve, he gets a fault. Mm -hmm. This is essentially DRM, digital rights management for computation. And if you can do this and wrap it with cryptographic strength defenses, you could do the most incredible things in the market. So how, do, how does he specify his computation? Well, she makes a contract that's digital and digitally signs it. He makes his computation in the form of C++, Python, JavaScript, Java, SQL, whatever. Defeating that contract requires guessing a very large key, breaking a hash or a cipher. 
So in this world, software hacking means nothing. All it lets you do is steal ciphertext. Hardware hacking outside of the enclave, the, the, the enclave we build, means nothing. It means just stealing ciphertext. Supply chain attacks mean nothing. If he changes his code, she, she didn't grant you the right to run that new code. That's not going to give you anything. And malicious programmers, malicious IT, they have no access to this underlying data. This is a really powerful technology. And so the value proposition you get into the pet market, restore privacy while enabling data monetization discovery. And here's some applications. And I want to just highlight two of these, right? Medical data registries. Medical data registries are how a lot of researchers get access to medical data to do research. And the way it works is a company sets up a database and it fills the database with information from lots of different hospitals. And that database is protected by that company to the best they can protect it. But if it gets breached, you break HIPAA laws and you know you, you, you basically destroy the IP of these hospitals, which is their medical data. And so these companies have to buy tons of insurance when they do this. Now, in this system, you can cryptographically wrap that data, never decrypt it, and you can limit what the researchers can do in terms of their analytics by simply saying the data owners, we would like to do these analytics, please allow us to do those analytics, and over only the period of the contract. What an amazing uh, thing that would be. It would, what it would do is it would loosen up a lot of data from hospitals that it doesn't go into data registries now and increase the view of these researchers and make discovery more effective. Let's look at privatized surveillance. Does anybody have like a Nest camera in your house or your backyard? Today, those Nest cameras have a continuous encrypted uh, stream of data that goes up to the cloud where it's decrypted and analyzed for sound, motion, and data and, you know, encrypted on their drives. But, you know, ultimately, who's ever providing that service can see that data. With this technology, the data owner is that camera. It sends its information up to the cloud. It does all of that analysis on sound, motion, and data and sends the encrypted data back. This server can't ever see that video data. But if she goes away on vacation, she can give him the right to tell him, to tell her via text, is there a face in my backyard? So you just enable face detection on the, on the imagery and you can see that one Boolean value and I'll text you if I see a face in your backyard. That is a privacy technology, super cool. So let's talk about this underlying technology that we use called sequestered encryption. It's got four basic features. First, high entropy cipher protects everything in the system that we care about. And what a high entropy cipher is, it basically looks like random, it's indistinguishable from pure random data. You can run an SE program and sample any of its encrypted variables, and it looks like pure random data. It's indistinguishable. In fact, that's the property it has, indistinguishable from pure random data. It has the ability to compute directly on encrypted data without software ever needing a key. It just says, add these two encrypted values together, divide these two encrypted values, et cetera. And it does so in a way that you cannot create digital side channels. You can't create a control or a memory side channel. And here in the computation is this notion of guard railing, which are end-to-end -end cryptographic integrity receipts, which allow the system to see if you ran an algorithm that was agreed upon in advance. Mm -hmm. If you did, that meant you weren't hit by a supply chain attack or you weren't hit by attack, attackers manipulating your computation. And then if the data owner gives you a data grant, which is an encrypted integrity receipt, it then becomes possible to decrypt a piece of information if you run the approved computation. So that way it, I can run my face detection algorithm on the backyard image and I can tell you the Boolean, true or false, can I see any data? But I don't get to see the original source data. I don't get to see any of the intermediate operations because they have different integrity computations. So back in the day when we only had end-to-end -end encryption, you couldn't do any of this stuff. And it was privacy, there wasn't much you could do with it. So companies basically say, I don't care about privacy. I'm going to do it anyway and I'm going to decrypt your data. Homomorphic encryption is really exciting because it, it enters this encrypted computation capability, but it doesn't allow you the ability to see the underlying data. So you always got to send it back to the data owner. Limits its utility. ZK proofs are nice because they can tell you whether a computation got hit or not, but they're still very experimental. They're not really deployed yet. And functional encryption is really a dream. It's, it works on plus right now, uh, and, 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 and it lets you limit what a particular program can release in terms of data. 
but we can bring a hardware security technology to this market today and do every one of these things and do it faster than all these other technologies and make it easier to program. Here's how it works, one slide. We deploy this thing called an SE Enclave. And what an SE Enclave is, it's an enclave that only contains a functional unit. We are trying to protect the computation, so we only protect the thing that does the computation. The trust boundary is a functional unit. It's an ALU. Functional unit, you know, so I got in there floating point units. I got my integer units. That's it. There's no memory in there, nothing else. Just a functional unit. Now, I need to get keys in there so that the functional unit can access the data, but I need to do it in a way where software can get access to the keys. And so I use a technology called PKI Key Exchange, which already exists. I issue the ALU a public-private key pair. My startup publishes the public keys of functional units. The whole cluster is under the same public key. And a data owner can encrypt their bulk key under the public key of this functional unit. The functional unit has a private key inside of it and it can expose that key. But that key is not accessible by any software or any other hardware. But the, what the hardware and the software can do is it can make risk-like operation requests to this enclave, right? Where an SGX enclave has function call interfaces. Since there's no software in my enclave, the interface is add these two values, rotate this value and crypto goes in and high entropy crypto comes out. And so the enclave is actually decrypting values as they come in, doing a simple computation on it and re-encrypting it. No state, there's no memory inside this box. It's just a protected functional unit. All the storing and caching and all the other stuff is done by the CPU and everything from the register file to the microarchitecture all the way down to the memory system and the disk is all high entropy ciphertext, protected all the time. 24 seven. And it does this thing without any software inside the box. So there's no so guaranteed no software vulnerabilities because there's no software and no digital side channels. And we can actually prove there's no digital side channels. That's hard to do on software, much easier to do on hardware. So the trust boundary here is just this little enclave and it's super tiny, super tiny. And we have that what differentiates us from homomorphic encryption is this trusted enclave. All right, and we need to physically protect that enclave from penetration and measurement, right? And today in the cloud, you know, we take over a whole FPGA, we don't allow multi-residency and the cloud is, is secure. So we can, we can achieve that through, you know, other methods. But as we go on, we'll, we'll figure out how to protect this against analog attacks as well. Today, we just protect the hardware against digital attacks. Okay, and that's what differentiates from homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption doesn't have that box, but with that box, I can run millions of times faster and I can be really programmable. So what we've done in our startup, Agile Labs, we've deployed a product. Our product is called TrustForge. It is a package for building and uh, programming zero trust sharing. It's deployed in Microsoft Azure today, and uh, we work with Microsoft to put it in their FPGAs. And it'll stu soon be on AWS as well in their FPGA nodes. And, and one day soon on a CPU die near you, which will be an even faster implementation. And what you get when you, when you subscribe to TrustForge, you get this FPGA-based SE Enclave, which today is deployed in the Azure and P10 20, 30 nodes. And then you get this SDK that works with basically any programming language that developers want to work with. And it's pretty straightforward to program in. Basically, if you want to protect a variable, you just define it to be an encrypted variable. And there's a bunch of helper functions to move data in and out of your system and to define, you know, all the various features it has. Quite easy to program compared to our competitors. And it's delivered as what's called a software as a service product. So basically you subscribe to it and then you pay by the node, by the hour. Investors love this. I love this. And it's a piece of hardware. You're basically renting the hardware to get access to this technology. And then lots of uh, help that you can get from the startup to build whatever you need to you know, improve your privacy practices. And you know we're in the market and we're working with customers and we'd love to work with people that want to use this technology today. And I want to just tell you a little bit about the, uh, the, the Azure version of the SE Enclave. It's deployed in Azure in an UltraScale Plus Xilinx FPGA, and we use 6% of the FPGA. We're 190,000 gates. So like 
all this technology, which sort of leapfrogs the whole industry of PAT, is 190,000 gates, right? Which, you know, when you're talking to someone that's doing a $2 billion, $2 billion transistor design and say, hey, will you put my 190,000 gates on it? To two decimal, three decimal places, that is 0% area, all right? So it's, uh, it's really tiny. We're concerned about people replacing this hardware. So it's both logic locked and watermarked. If you're familiar with silicon assurance technologies, we use both those technologies today. And then there's no key burned into this device. We can't use a puff, right? Because we don't know which FPGA we're going to be on. So the way we build a key for this SE Enclave is we use another secure computation protocol that is NUS. We use MPC. So we use one of our competitors to build that key initially. It works quite well. Uh, and then I want to show you the performance profile of this device. This is deployed, working. You can play with it. Uh, you can even go, uh, you can, you know, go commercial with this right now. And recall earlier that if you're less than 300 times slow down in this market, you are blazingly fast, right? 300x makes you market leader. Uh, we today, in a discrete FPGA, pushing crypto through a PCIe channel to a Xilinx FPGA, we are 55 times slower than native. So already day one, this is the worst implementation of this tech from a performance standpoint, it's, I mean, it's great from a functional standpoint, the worst performance implementation we'll ever, ever see is 55x slower than native. We're working with Intel. There won't, there, you know, we work closely with Intel uh, to put this on their integrated CPU FPGAs. And I'm looking forward to also working with AMD when their FPGAs come out next year. These are integrated FPGAs on chip. There, we're about 18x slower than native just by moving to those faster interfaces, more tightly integrated parts. If we can get on a future SOC, which I hope to announce soon, uh, we will be within 5x of native, right? Now, getting below 300x is really an amazing feat in this market. And then I just want to point you to Lauren's talk in the next session, where she talks about integrating this technology into CPU pipeline, and then it's completely realistic to get within 20% of native fully encrypted computation using a bunch of really clever tricks she's developed as part of her PhD work. So that's our kind of our performance roadmap. If you look at us against other elements in the marketplace, kind of the, 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 the most performant HE technology out there today is Microsoft Seal. Now, Microsoft Seal is performant because it has no bootstrapping, which, which means values decay as you use them. And it has only plus and multiply operator supported. So you need to take your application as an express it as only an equation with pluses and multiplies with up to, uh, you know, a power of maybe four polynomials. Incredibly difficult. 16 times faster than that. If you want to take what's called a Turing complete secure computation framework, you got to look at something like Boolean garbled circuits multi-party computation. In that framework, you can program anything, and we're 6,000 times faster. The problem with MPC, though, is it's hackable. If you can hack all the machines that are on the MPC network, you can recover all the data. So it ultimately is software hackable. If you want to get a technology that's Turing complete and not software hackable, you got to go to what's called Boolean fully homomorphic encryption. And a, a really great package for this is uh, TFHE and the Google Transpiler that works with it, where you basically take software and you map it to gates and then you run those gates in a fully homomorphic encryption. So we took our enclave, stripped it down, took all the crypto out because it was running in FHE and put it on TFHE and we were 607 million times faster than that target. That is where, you know, that is where they got to get to make these systems really programmable. So let me just give you a few parting thoughts. And, and, and I want to encourage you to think about the privacy market, because I think this is a place that can be very beneficial to us, the hardware security developers. But first, I want to talk about things that are, you have taught me, people in this community have taught me, that has really defined the work that I want to do in the, in, you know, in the last few years and the years ahead. And what you've taught me is that we will never, ever stop software hacking. It will never stop. There isn't a time where we figured out how to stop software hacking. Software is the vulnerability, not the bugs in software. Software is the vulnerability. And then two great examples that I always like to talk about is blind drop, which is a beautiful attack. It doesn't even know you need to know your instruction set. 
and Spectre V1. Who's stopping Spectre V1? And then two, we will never, ever stop main core microarchitectural side channels. We're never going to stop. But come on, let's, let's all agree to that. We're not going to stop them. That is a security arms race for the hardware world. There's no way to stop them because there's just too much tension between performance and side channels. Take a look at Taru's talk in the previous session where you know he talked about how to build a cache attack where it's completely agnostic to every, every aspect of the cache to the design. So if you want to build hardware security that's more useful, I would encourage this to really try to build more durable defenses. Durable defenses are defenses that are going to be really tough to take down. Ideally, we want cryptographic strength defenses. And there's really only two durable things that we have access to that I know of. One is time-tested cryptography. So any cryptography that's been around for a while, and if you do a solid implementation of it, it will protect against confidentiality and integrity attacks. And the second is side channel free hardware design. That's And that's free through design techniques and proof techniques as well. That can stop information leakage. Certainly in the digital domain, and I think as we go forward, we can start to focus more on the analog domain here as well. And then I just wanna close by saying what an opportune moment it is to be a hardware security architect. I truly believe in my heart of heart that the privacy problem is not solved by cryptography. It's solved by the hardware security architect. Because while you know the, the homomorphic encryptions and the MPCs of the world are out there trying to get less than 10,000 X, we will be delivering you know, near native computation that's fully encrypted with integrity checks, with safe data grants, and all we have to do is protect these tiny little enclaves that we're going to be building in the future. And we'll find better and better ways to do that all the time. Over in the pet community, we go from zero to hero, and we can really perfect our craft. And what I suggest our craft should be is efficient cryptographic strength defenses, defenses that fall when you guess the huge key. And as we become more and more efficient in that domain, then we can start to bring technologies back to the security domain and try to stop data breaches and try to stop software hacking, but do it in a more durable fashion with cryptographic strength defenses that aren't so expensive that people laugh you off the chip. And so I really see this as a path. Let's depart for a while, go and be heroes over in the pet community and really perfect our craft and continue to improve that and then come back to um, security later. As we, as we develop those technologies. And I, I think that's a pretty good approach. That's what I'll be doing, and I would suggest you to think about the same as well. Thanks. If you want to learn more about TrustForge, definitely reach out to the startup. This is the startup today. Uh, we'd love to tell you more. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate your time.